Well, we are in session six of the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, just by way of a quick review, it's of course in Hebrew translated. I put this up front just to remind us that the translations are always have their, their subtleties that we may miss in the, in the translation. The theme of the book, of course, is exemplified not only in the opening verses, the words of the preacher, that's Solomon, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And he's going to emphasize that, of course. On the one hand, I think many people misunderstand uh, his, his perceptions. He says, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? So his focus, his centroid, his scope, his perspective is really that of our life on the earth, with only a glimpse now and then of the fact that there very much is an afterlife. I might mention this verse, the equivalent of it, is also at the chapter 12, the closing chapter of the book. The book is called in Hebrew the Koheleth, which means the gather of an assembly or the preacher. And uh, when that's translated into Greek in the Septuagint, it's called Ecclesia, and it's from the Latinization of that that we get our word Ecclesiastes. And uh, it's on the natural man's quest for the chief good, it is an integrated, highly organized treatise. It's not just a random... Th- like the book of Proverbs is just a concatenation of Proverbs, but the book of Ecclesiastes is highly organized. It need to understand that to really get his flow of thought. It concludes that all is vanity. But don't think he's pessimistic. He's really more bravely honest than pessimistic. And the key is that you'll notice if you look carefully that he it looks beyond life's ironies that are dwelled upon toward the fact that God is really in control and there will be future restitutions put this all in perspective, which implies we won't get our perspective just from our, the horizon that we can see as we go forward. Uh, and of course, it focuses on the final significance. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I want to focus this on this because many people have a very myopic view of the book of Ecclesiastes. This is where Solomon is heading, ultimately, as he examines life as he sees it. Now, we're going to be in chapter 9, which could be subtitled, Meeting Your Last Enemy, Death. And this is not the first time that the subject of death has come up into his discourse, nor will it be the last. We saw it in chapter 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, 6, 8 and we'll see it again in 12, and so on. You'll discover that in this chapter, Solomon is going to draw two conclusions. One is that death is unavoidable. That'll be in the first 10 verses. And then life itself is unpredictable in the last nine verses. Can't, whenever I think of death, I'm reminded of Woody Allen's fa- famous crack. He says, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> but if it, each of us, including Woody Allen, will be there when it happens. Because there's no escaping of death and when your time has come. And death is not an accident. It's an appointment. That's an appointment. That's what Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto men and women to want, but once to die, and after this the judgment. That expression, of course, is intended and focused on a rebuttal to reincarnation. It's interesting how all the Eastern religions and so forth They all have various versions of reincarnation. That is a pagan idea. It is expressly refuted in the Scripture, especially by Hebrews 9.27. Death is a destiny that nobody but God can cancel or change. Whenever I come across the subject of reincarnation, I find it irresistible to include a poem that uh, was called to my attention some years ago, if you'll bear with me. What is reincarnation? A cowboy asked his friend. It starts, his old pal told him, when your life comes to an end. They comb your hair, they wash your neck, they clean your fingernails, and they put you in a padded box away from life's travails. Now the box in you goes into the hole that's been dug in the ground. Reincarnation starts in when you're planted neath that mound. Them clods don't melt down just like the box and you who is inside. And that is when you begin your transformation ride. And in a while the grass will grow upon your rendered mound, till someday upon that spot a lonely flower is found. And then a horse may wander by and graze upon that flower that once was you and now has become your vegetated bower. Now the flower the horse done eat, along with his other feed, makes bone and muscle and fat and essential to the steed. But there's a part that he can't use, so it just passes through. 
And there it lies upon the ground, this thing that once was you. And if perchance I should pass by and see this on the ground, I'll stop a while and ponder at this object that I found. And I'll think about reincarnation and life and death and such. But I'll come away concluding why you ain't changed all that much. <laughs> Wallace, <laughs> Wallace McRae. Well, I apologize if that's a strange thing to insert. I couldn't resist including it, but whenever people start talking about reincarnation, I'm always remembered by what, what's called the cowboy poem. But we're going to be talking about this issue of death, in more, obviously in more serious terms. And uh, the only way to be prepared to live is to be prepared to die. Death is a fact of life. And Solomon is going to examine many of the f facets of life so that he might really understand God's pattern for satisfied living in the reality of death. Robert E. Lee's famous words were, let the tent be struck. See, and unless Jesus Christ returns and takes us to heaven in the rapture, we all, each one of us, one day will strike our tent, as that might be expressed in 2 Corinthians 5 and so on. And uh, we'll leave the battlefield for a better land, but we've got to be ready. And anyone who treats death lightly may fear death the most. And if we take life seriously, and we should then we can't take death flippantly. So let's take a look at what the king, who has been dubbed the wisest man that's ever lived, says about these things from his point of view. So says, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked and to the good and to the clean and to the unclean and to him that sacrifices and to him that sacrifices not. As is the good, so is the sinner and he that sweareth, he that sweareth an oath. And so, see, only God knows our future. And he only knows whether it will bring blessing or sorrow. And up there, in other words, love or hatred, as it talks about in the first verse there. No man knoweth either love or hatred, or in other words, blessings or, or, or sorrow. Now, I should emphasize, Psalm is not presuming that we are somehow uh, uh, passive actors in a cosmic drama with some kind of uh, unchangeable script handed to us by some uncaring director, not so. And throughout the book, Psalm is going to emphasize our freedom of discernment and decision. Now, only God may know what the, whole, the future holds for us and what will happen tomorrow, because of the decisions that we make today. And this is one of those places that if I had the time, I'd be tempted to insert one of my classic uh, digressions on the nature of the time domain. But people who argue about predestination versus free will are people who are arguing from within the constraints of a three-dimensional universe. Or I should say, if ignoring this, the fourth dimension called time. Because within our existence, we have free choice. But God is outside our dimensionality of time and happens to know and see ahead what our choice is going to be. To us, that seems like a contradiction. You see, there's, it's either deterministic or it's uh, indeterminate. No, not so. You, you determine your choices. It's just that God is outside the dimensionality of time. And then verse 2, all things come alike to all. There's one event to the righteous, one to the wicked, and so forth. And all these contrasts. Righteous, wicked, good, uh, you know, clean and unclean, and sacrifice and not sacrifice. So what, what Psalm is really pointing out, we have a common destiny on the earth, but we uh, do not share a common destiny after death in eternity. All of us, good and bad, may sh you know, face death, the reality of death. It's coming. But that doesn't mean that our, our, our destinies are identical after we die. And it's for that reason that each of us need to face what, what Paul calls in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy, death. And we need to decide how we're going to deal with that. And uh, Christians who have trusted Christ to save them from sin and death, uh, 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 for them, the last enemy has already been defeated. Romans 6, John 11, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, of course, it's the climactic passage and all those things. Unbelievers do not have that confidence and are unprepared to die whether they admit it or not. And so how, they, how people deal with the reality of death reveals the way they deal with the realities of life. 
Solomon is going to point out three possible responses that people have to the ever-present reality of death. In verse 3, he'll talk about escape. In verse 4 to 6, endurance. And verses 7 to 10, enjoyment. Escape, endurance, enjoyment. So let's go to verse 3. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness in the heart while they are alive, and after that they go to the dead. What's suggested here is that death, or the fear of death, the fact of death, will bring out the best in people or the worst. See, when death comes to a family, it doesn't create problems, it reveals them. You know, many many uh, ministers and many uh, funeral directors and so forth will point out that there's almost an x-ray power of death and bereavement because it reveals the hearts of people. And when we're facing the death of others, uh, you know, uh, we're confronted with our own death, and many people just can't handle it. And it can be one of the most profound opportunities to bear witness to the reality of Jesus Christ. I think that's one of the main themes in my wife's book, Faith in the Night Seasons is that the uh, pressures of bereavement or other major uh, dark times can be powerful, powerfully used of the Lord for our own spiritual growth and so forth. Well, the next of the three is endurance, interestingly enough. Psalm goes on to say, For him, to him that is joined to all living, there is hope. <laughs> for the living dog is better than a dead lion. That's obviously probably an old uh, a proverb that he, he uh, drew upon. Um, it's sort of an echo of where there's life, there's hope, and so forth. But um, the, uh, that motto, by the way, goes back as far as the 3rd century B.C. It was part of a conversation between f two farmers who were featured in a poem by the Greek poet Theocritus. Console yourself, dear Bato, says Corydon. Uh, Things may be better tomorrow. While there's life, there's hope. Only the dead have none. That actually goes back to 300 years before Christ as a, as a quote. But uh, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. That's from an earthly point of view. See, for a Christian, the Christian has a, a living hope, not a dead hope. Why? Because we worship a living Savior. We don't venerate, we don't venerate someone who's past dead, as other, other groups might. We worship a living Savior. The big difference. He's alive and he's conquered death. That's the key point. 1 Peter 1 and 1 Timothy 1 both deal with that. And uh, See, a hope that can be destroyed by death is a dead hope, a false hope. It's in, it must be soon abandoned. You know, what Solomon wrote about the dead can be reversed and applied to the living. The dead do not know what is happening on the earth, but the living know and can respond to it. The dead cannot add to any, anything to their reward or their reputation, but the living can is the ellipsis to what he's really saying here. See, death is the end of opportunity. And uh, the dead can't relate to people on the earth by loving, hating, envying, but the living can. And he's emphasizing, what he's in effect doing, he's emphasizing the importance of seizing the opportunities where we're alive, rather than blindly hoping for something better in the future, because death will end that kind of a hope. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. The next theme, he's talked about uh, escape, endurance. Then he gets his third uh, response to all this is his favorite theme. That's enjoyment. It's amazing how, how Solomon pushes on that issue. It's one of his most reoccurring themes in chapter 2, 3, 5, 8, and he's going to bring it up again in, the, in, in chapter 11. And his, because his next thing is enjoyment. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white. Well, I'll get to the garments in a minute. Uh, his admonition, go thy way, is in effect saying, don't sit around and brood. Get up and live is what he's really saying. Yes, death's coming, but God gives us good gifts to, en to enjoy, so enjoy them. And, uh, you know, Solomon, of course, like, uh, as you can imagine, sat down to a daily feast. We see that recorded in 1 Kings 4 and elsewhere. But, you know, there is evidence that Solomon himself didn't enjoy it much. You get the impression that he had a lot of meals he did not enjoy. In Proverbs fifteen seventeen, he says, Better a meal of vegetables where there is love 
than a fattened calf with hatred. That's the NIV version of that. In uh, Proverbs 17, it opens up, with better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. (laughs) For Solomon to say something like that suggests at least that he must have experienced some of those. When we get to verse 8, he's going to suggest that we should enjoy every occasion. Let thy garments be always white. Let thy head lack no ointment. See, they wore their white garments as a symbol of joy. They anointed themselves with perfumes and such instead of the usual olive oil when, on special occasions. And when these occasions came, they really made the most of them. So what Solomon is saying, in effect, what he's saying here, always wear white garments and anoint yourself always with special perfume. We must not express our thanksgiving and our joy only when celebrating special events. Let me give you a practical example. There are many people that get gorgeous silver settings as a wedding gift. And then you put them away and use them, what, five or six times in your lifetime? Do they ever wear out? Hardly. Why not use your best silver every day? Maybe not literally, but that's the spirit of what Solomon's saying. Uh, If you want to put it in the Latin, carpe diem. Seize the day. Every day is an opportunity. And it's strange that he would come to that focus by emphasizing that death is certain. So we've got so many days, make the most of them, in effect. You know, Paul said the same thing. He said, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Solomon continues, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work nor device nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. In other words, make the most of the days you have is really what he's saying. You know, he's not saying for us to join the fast track or the jet set and uh, start looking for exotic uh, pleasures in faraway places. Instead, he's going to list, uh, he's already listed some of the common experience of life. Happy home, leisurely meals in verse 7. Joyful family celebrations in verse 8. A faithful, loving marriage in verse 9. And of course, hard work. You can enjoy hard work in verse 10. You know, this is a real contrast to the conventional wisdom in our society for happiness. You know, fast food and a full schedule, the addictive pursuit of anything new, and the so-called live-in marriages that characterize our culture, and shortcuts to help you avoid work and still get rich quick. This is just the opposite formula that Solomon lays out for us for real happiness. You know, it's interesting, though, if you look, listen carefully in our society, there are voices calling us back to the old traditions. There are people that are beginning to recognize that there was a value in the traditional walks of life. There is a, people are recognizing there, there is an emptiness in living on substitutes. They want more, something more substantial than the right labels in their clothes or the right names to drop in the right places and so forth. It's sort of like the younger brother in the, in the famous, uh, story of the prodigal son, where he, uh, he finally discovers that everything that was really important was back home with his father. And the other, the other thought that obviously emerges here is to really enjoy your work. Boy, if you're, if you're enjoying your work, you're a happy person. If you're doing work that you don't enjoy, that can be a, a, heavy, a heavy thing on your back. And uh, you know, look, people that really enjoy their work have an incredible blessing. You know, the Jewish people looked upon work not as a curse, but as a stewardship from God. And there's even an expression that uh, you know, work at home is a kind of prayer. Working on your home or plowing your own field is a kind of prayer. It's the expression they use. Every rabbi learned a trade. That was one of the requirements. He had to learn a trade. Uh, Paul was a tent maker, example. And he says, he reminds them that he does not work and, or, and teaches son to work, uh, teaches him to steal. That's an old rabbinical prayer. And Paul wrote, if, you, if, if any would not work, neither should he eat. Second Thessalonians 3. Or do it all with all, with all your might is the way the NASB deals with this. And also Paul in Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So all the things that we find enjoyment in will not be in the grave. Show of the realm of the dead. So make the most opportunities now. It's sort of the flavor of what Solomon is suggesting here. Now one day our works will be judged, and we'll want to receive a reward uh, for His glory. 
Now, this, that, the first ten verses are the, on this death theme, if you will, using that as his anvil for his thoughts. But the next, the rest of this chapter emphasizes that life is unpredictable. How many have noticed that? You notice that life is unpredictable? Huh? Okay. Psalm says, I returned and I saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. See, our abilities are no guarantee of success. You can't, as they say, you can't assure success. You can only endeavor to deserve it. Now, it's generally true, of course, the fastest runner, you know, runners win the races, the strongest soldiers do win the battles, and so forth. But it's a general rule. It's not, it's not a certainty. The same gifted people can fail miserably because their factors get out of their control. In fact, you know, there have been studies of, of successful executives, and you'll find people heading companies that aren't necessarily the brightest, best educated, what have you. The only common thread that they found among the success, successful ones is perseverance. Perseverance. A successful person does, of course, know how to make the most of time and procedure, but uh, only the Lord can control time and chance, as expressed here. Proverbs 16.33, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. The lot is in the lap of the Lord, in other words. You know, it's interesting. There are two concepts in mathematics that you cannot find in the physical universe. One of them is infinity. We can define it. We know what it is mathematically. We can't find it in physical things. The, if you look at the, in the large scale, the, the great discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is finite. It's not infinite. And that's what led to the Big Bang, the realization that it, then it, that's, that must have had a beginning. It's, not, it's finite. And at the microcosm, on the on small side of things, you think things could get infinitely small. They've discovered that's not true. You can't get a length that's less than 10 to the 30, minus 33 centimeters. You can't find a unit of time smaller than 10 to the minus 43 seconds because they discover that length, mass, energy, time, all these things are quantized. They're made up of individual units. They're digitized or quantized. That's what, that's what they mean by the field of quantum physics. It's a study of those things. It's a real shocker. We're in a simulation, so to speak, that is bounded digitally at the smallest end at the biggest end. It's finite. And uh, that's disturbing. And the more you study that, the more disturbing it is. One of the early quantum physicists committed suicide because he could, he understood the implications of that and he couldn't handle it. If you've seen the movie, The Thirteenth Floor, in which the plot depends on being in a virtual reality and in some surprising ways, it's a very, very provocative uh, piece of work. Well, there's another concept in mathematics besides infinity that we can't find in the physical universe. That's randomness. We speak of randomness, something random chance, and we construct mathematical models that are useful in that they're what they're, they're technically called pseudo-random numbers and uh, such. That's what led to the field, a new field of mathematics called theory of chaos. But they've discovered even even the concept of randomness is elusive in, in the physical universe. Now, you know, Solomon already affirmed that God has a time for everything. Remember chapter 3, a time for this and a time for that and so on a purpose to be fulfilled in that time, and so on. The assurance from chapter 8 that something beautiful would come out of that at the end. But Christians, obviously, do not depend on luck or chance for a lot of other reasons. Our confidence is in the providence of God. And uh, you see, a, a true Christian does not carry around a rabbit's foot or a lucky charm of some kind or has lucky days or lucky numbers. Every day is holy to the Lord, so... Okay, let's go to verse 12. For man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net or as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. In other words, who knows when trouble will fall, come on the scene. And wasn't it Bobby Burns that said, uh, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after the glay? I think I got that right. I forgot, meant to look that up before I made my notes here. So when you least expect it, the fish are, fish are caught or birds are caught, whatever, men too are snared. And, uh, and that's one reason that in chapter 11, that'll be we'll the next time, Solomon is going to emphasize diversification in your investments because you don't know what a day brings forth. He's very strong on diversification. We'll talk a lot about that and its implications in our, in our 
subsequent session. And that's also, this is also why we should take very, very much to heart uh, James's admonitions against boasting in James chapter 4. But let's you and I keep moving so we make it, because we've got another chapter to go here. Uh, verse 13, This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city, and few men within it. And there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, and yet no man remembered that same poor man. Now it's not quite clear from this little anecdote that Solomon includes here whether the wise man actually delivered the city or whether he could have saved it and, and was asked, but it was not heeded. Some commentators, the Wiersbe and others, who I respect very highly in this area particularly, uh, he says he lean, leans to the second explanation because it fits better with the verses that follow, verses 16 through 18, which we'll get in a minute. The Hebrew here allows for the translation, he could have, he could have uh, delivered the city. In other words, the little city was besieged and uh, the wise men could have delivered it, but nobody paid any attention to him as the thought seemed to be contained in the Hebrew. Let's go take a look at verse 16. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. See, the tone of this is that he could have saved it, but nobody would listen to him. The words of the wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. See, verse 17 suggests that the ruler had a loud mouth, and he got all the attention and led the people into defeat. The wise man spoke quietly but was ignored. So the opportunity for greatness was frustrated by one loud, ignorant man. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war, and one sinner destroyeth much good. Now that truth is illustrated throughout Scripture. Adam and his disobedience with God in chapter 3, amplified in Romans 5. Remember when Achan sinned and brought defeat on the army of Israel in Joshua chapter 7. Well, remember that. David's sin brought trouble to Israel, 2 Samuel 24. And of course the revolt of Absalom led the nation into civil war ultimately in 2 Samuel and so on. Since death is unavoidable and life is unpredictable, the only course that's really available to the wise is to yield ourselves into the hands of God and walk by faith in His Word. We don't live by explanations, we live by promises. We don't depend on luck, but on the providential working of our loving Father. We trust His promises and we obey His will. And if we walk by faith, when we have no fear of the last enemy that Solomon introduced this in this section. Why? Because Jesus has conquered death. Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 1. It opens up that way. And because he is alive and we live in him, we don't look at life and say vanity of vanities. Solomon may say that we can't. Instead, we can echo the confidence expressed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of our Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Which leads us then to chapter 10. This is, could be called the danger of folly, chapter 10. The danger of folly. The word folly occurs about nine times in this chapter. Dead flies cost the anointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly in him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Now he, he had already compared a good name, a reputation to a fragrant perfume back in chapter 7. He's going to use this image again. See what dead flies are to perfume. <laughs> That's what folly is to one's reputation. In other words, uh, the conclusion is obviously that wise people will stay away from folly. Or somebody said one whoops can erase 50 attaboys, so to speak. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. I love this verse. It sounds like a partisan political statement to me. A wise man's heart is at the right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. But um, that's really not what he's taken about. You can, you can quote that to the left-hand liberals if you like, but uh, that's, really, <laughs> that's really, I don't think, what, what Solomon has in mind. He also, when he that is a fool walketh by way, his wisdom faileth him, and he that saith to everyone that he is a fool. 
See, the, it, it, the, when he's talking about the heart here, he's not obviously not talking about the physical organ of the heart. It has nothing to do with wisdom or folly. He's referring to this, when he speaks of the center of life, the master control within us, when he says heart, if you will, that governs the issues of life. And in the ancient world, by the way, it's interesting, the right hand was always the place of power and honor. And the left hand represented weakness and rejection. And uh, many people consider the left to be un, you know, unlucky. Uh, the English word sinister, it's an English word meaning left. The French word gauche, use that word in a social sense. He's gauche, I mean clumsy, he's, uh, un, that's, it means left. Uh, we have sinister and dexter. Sinister is left, dexter is right. But we, the word sinister has come to mean that which is evil or that which is less or whatever. And uh, if you've studied sculpt, the ancient, the, the classical art, uh, probably best exemplified by Rodin, the sculptor, you'll notice that the hand of God, his famous uh, thing, is it's always a right hand. He has a very famous um, sculpture called the cathedral. It's two hands, just in, pra- in the attitude of prayer. It's very well known. If you go to the Philadelphia Rosanna Museum, you'll see it featured there, among all those other things. But many people don't notice the two hands that make up Rodin's cathedral are both right hands. It's two people. It's not one person with both hands. There's two right hands, which is kind of interesting. But again, see, it's that classic concept that right is good and left is, is, is evil. And that's sort of what's behind the, the verse here. And of course, the, the fool doesn't have wisdom in his heart, so he gravitates to that which is long, wrong, that is the left. And thus he gets into trouble. People try to correct him, but he refuses to listen and tells everybody that, thus that he's a fool by not listening to the correction. And so now what Solomon, having laid down this idea, is going to apply it to four different fools. And the first one is the foolish ruler, starting in, in verse 4. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. For he, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceeds from the, from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. If there's anybody that really needs wisdom, of course, it's the ruler. And uh, that's why when God asked Solomon what gift he wanted, he asked for wisdom. What a shrewd request, if you're going to rule people especially. Lyndon B. Johnson is quoted as having said, a president's hardest task is not to do what is right, it's to know what is right. And uh, it's tragic that uh, in today's educational environment, there is not even an acknowledgement that there is a thing called right or truth. I can remember um, my parents were from the old country. My dad was a very simple, practical guy. But his concept, you go to school to learn what's right and wrong. That's basically what you go to school for. And uh, how shocked he would be if he discovered that today's schools don't even have, do not have that as a goal. They don't even acknowledge that right and wrong exists. Value of relativism destroys... Uh, not only doesn't it create the sense of values, it destroys all purpose of education. That's what Alan Bloom de- develops in his famous book, The Closing of the American Mind, that in this pursuit of openness, we've actually closed our minds because we've dis- dis- discovered if, if there's really no truth and there's no real incentive to understand history that it ha- because it has no relevant lessons for the future. And that's, of course, utter nonsense, but it leads us to a closed mind and not an open mind, ironically enough. Anyway, uh, if the ruler, according to verse 4, if the ruler is proud, he may do it and say foolish things. That will cause him to lose the respect of his uh, associates. And the picture here is, of course, that of a proud ruler and who easily becomes angry and takes his anger out on his attendants around him. And you can always spot a weak ruler by the strength of the people around him. If you're so insecure as to have weak pe- be surrounded by weak people, that's a real danger sign. The strong guys encourage constructive dissent. As they joke around in business, where two people agree, one is unnecessary. <laughs> Proverbs 16.32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than he that mighty, and he that rules the spirit more so than he that takes a city. Proverbs 25.28, Whosoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Now he goes on to point out that it's not necessary for servants to act like fools. In fact, that's the worst thing they can do. That was, that was developed back in chapter 8 also, you may recall. Far better that they control themselves and stay right uh, where they can, they are, and seek to bring peace. Proverbs twenty-five, fifteen: Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. Or Proverbs sixteen, fourteen: A king's wrath is a messenger of death, but a wise man shall appease it. Now, of course, there is a place, a time, and a place for righteous anger, and it sometimes does need to be displayed. Ephesians four talks about that. 
But not everything that we call righteous indignation is either righteous, <laughs> and it's uh, so easy to be motivated by uh, jealousy and malice, and then disguising them as a zeal for God. A crusader, his zeal can be a mask covering a hidden anger or jealousy for some other reason. But let's, uh, in, in verse 5, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and so forth. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in a low place. A ruler is too pliable. He's also a fool. He lacks courage and a character and courage. I remember seeing a, a, a uh, interesting, in, in one of the offices of one, of one of my bosses years ago, in his office he had a, a backbone. Actually, it was a plastic one, probably one of these plastic skeleton sets, but it was just a backbone framed under glass. And it had a little sign that this is a backbone. You can't run a project without it. Never forgotten that. Now, if a ruler has incompetent people advising him, he's obviously certain to be ruling the nation unwisely. And Solomon's own son, Rehoboam, uh, was proud and unyielding, and that led to the civil war and dividing the division of the kingdom. So instead of following the advice of his counselors, he listened to his youthful friends and... Uh, made the elders walk and let the young, put the young men on horses. The best rulers and leaders are men and women who are tough-minded but tender-hearted, who put the best people on the horses and don't apologize for it. That's sort of the flavor of the, the verse 7. I've seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants. How ironic it was, that's exactly, in effect, what Re- Rehoboam did. Well, his next series of verses from 8 to 11 will be about foolish workers. He started with the rulers, now he's going to talk about the workers. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If an iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Bear in mind, these are translations, and... and, uh, so, uh, it, it's weird to be suggested what Psalm is focusing on here are people who attempted to do their work but suffered by not doing it smartly. Uh, commentators are quite divided about this section because the, the point is it, it, they're not agreed on what his real points are. It's, the, the, the translations are difficult. Is he saying that every job is, has its occupational hazards? If so, what was the lesson he was teaching and why take so much space to illustrate the obvious? His theme is folly. And so he's not teaching that hard work is foolish because you might get injured. That's not what he's trying to say. And uh, all the way through uh, the book, Psalm's going to emphasize the value of honest labor and the joys it can bring. So why should he contradict his message here? And it's Wearsby, I think, that highlights that what he's really talking about is that people are doing, trying to do their work, but they're not doing it, they're doing it foolishly. They're not doing it smart. One man dug, dug, you know, dug a pit, but is it, well, it may have been a well or a place for storing grain, but he fell in the pit himself. Why? Because he apparently didn't take the proper precautions. And frequently the, the, the scripture uses this as a picture of retribution, but that doesn't seem to be the lesson here. And uh, another man broke through a hedge, a wall or a fence, perhaps while remodeling his home, or, and a serpent bit him. Now serpents found their ways into hidden crevices and so forth. The man should have been more careful. He was overconfident and didn't you know, look ahead. Verse 9 takes us into the quarries and forests where careless workers are injured, cutting stones or splitting logs. And uh, verse 10 talks about the foolish worker par excellence. He's a man who tried to split wood with a dull axe. The wise worker will pause and sharpen it. In other words, don't work harder, work smarter. It's basically the flavor that would tend to unify these messages. That's why I think Wearsby's handle on this is better than all the other ones I've seen. Verse 11, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and the babbler is no better. Now he's, <laughs> the babbler is, a, the Hebrew actually says the master of the tongue. See, you have to understand, snake charmers were common in those days as entertainers. Uh, you know, it's interesting, this, you know, the snakes have no, uh, no ears. They pick up the sound waves primarily through the bone structure of their head. So the more music, I should say more than the music played by the charmer, it's the man's disciplined actions, the swaying and, and the staring that hold the snake's attention and keep, keep the serpent under control. This apparently is really the, the secret to the art form. Psalm's describing here a serpent that uh, bit the snake charmer um, before the man had an opportunity to charm it or to gain control of it. So um, by, by risking his life, 
uh, this charmer could not collect uh, any money from the spectators. They'd only laugh at him because he's a fool and uh, would be rushed at and, and, and so on. Some charmers had a mongoose available that would caught the snake just at the right time and save the man from being bitten. And of course, if the mongoose missed his cue, the man would be in bad shape. But either way, the guy was foolish. Probably foolish in the first place for playing those kinds of games. But, but um, the common denominator among all of these foolish workers seems to be presumption. They're overconfident, and they ended up hurting themselves or making the job harder. He now shifts, if you will, to um, foolish talkers in, uh, in verse 12. The words of the wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of the fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. We're going to discover, of course, that in the book of Proverbs, uh, Solomon had much to say about the speech of fools. But in this uh, section here, He's going to point out four characteristics of the foolish words. In, first, in the first case, they're destructive in verse 12. The, the, the words of the wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of the fool will swallow up himself. And whether you're talking about just personal conversation or if you're talking about public ministry, it's interesting that the Lord always knew the right thing to say at the right time. And that's even prophesied in Isaiah 50, verse 4. And we should try to emulate him. The fool blurts out whatever's on his mind doesn't stop to consider um, who might be hurt by it. In the end, of course, the fool himself would be hurt the most. A fool is consumed by his own lips. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens his wide his lips shall have destruction. Verse, Proverbs 13, 3. Proverbs 21, 23. Whosoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. See, we may try to hurt other people with lies and slander and angry words, but they're really, we're really hurting ourselves the most. Verse 13, the beginning of words of his mouth is foolishness. The end of his talk is mischievous madness. NASB says the beginning of his talking is folly. And the end of it is wicked madness. In other words, what he says, what he, what he says doesn't make sense. The longer he talks, the crazier it becomes. The, he would be better off to keep quiet because all, he says, all that he says lets everybody know that he's a fool in effect. And uh, Paul called these people unruly and vain talkers in Titus 1. J.B. Phillips translated it as who will not recognize authority or who talk nonsense. One way of looking at it. But okay, verse 14. A fool is also full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Is full of words, well, or multiplieth words in the Hebrew is what it really says. And the, the fool is full of words without realizing he's saying nothing. In Proverbs 10, uh, Solomon says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Or James emphasized this in James chapter 3, you may recall. A person who cannot control his or her tongue is unable to um, discipline his whole body. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, Let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatsoever more is more than these is of evil. It's from the evil one. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to, uh, to the city. People who talk about the future talk as though they, they either knew all about it or are in control of what will happen. In Proverbs 27, 1, Do not boast thyself about tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. And Solomon continually emphasizes man's ignorance of the future. And uh, it's a truth that wise people receive, but fools reject. We can't protect the future. That's why when Solomon gets to investing, which he will in chapter 11, he's going to talk intensely about, uh, in effect, about uh, diversifying your investments. And there's kind of a, there's a bit, incidentally, there's a humorous tone to this because the fool boasts about his future plans and wearies people with his talk, but he can't even find the way to the city is what, in effect, uh, he's saying here. Uh, or the common expression today, he's so dummy he can't learn the route of an elevator. You know, this is an is a, is a analogous time. And so, the, the, see, in the Bibli even in biblical times, the roads to the city were well marked. And this idea that he can't find the way to the city is, is, is even in their context, you know, sort of you know, demeaning. It's a demeaning expression. We're now going to get from chapter 16 on, we're going to talk about officers, foolish officers. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. I'm reminded, I have in my office, in fact, hanging a, a little thing from Napoleon's period for his officers. He says, I divide my officers into four classes, the brilliant and the stupid, the industrious and the lazy. Those that are brilliant and industrious are fitted for the highest staff positions. 
Work can also be found for the stupid and lazy. Those who are brilliant and lazy have the requisite nerve for the highest command positions. But those who are stupid and industrious present a danger and must be removed at all costs. <laughs> so he's already described foolish rulers, but now he's going to expose the folly of the officers who work under those rulers, the bureaucrats who are part of the machinery of the kingdom. And it's interesting to have this, this indictment laid down by the king himself, actually. He's going to talk about indulgence, incompetence, indifference, and indiscretion. Four areas. Indulgence, incompetence, indifference, and indiscretion. The first couple of verses, 16 and then the verse 17, are about indulgence. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the land of nobles, excuse me, the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. In other words, the first kind of foolishness is, is uh, indulgence. If the king is immature, he'll gather around them people who uh, also reflect that immaturity and take advantage of it. And if he's a true nobleman, he'll surround himself with really noble officers who put the good of the country first. Real leaders who use their authority to build the nation. Not just office holders or hirelings, if you will. You don't want people to use public funds for their private purposes. The, it's a judgment of God when a people are given immature leaders. And that's Isaiah chapter 3, the first five verses of chapter 3 emphasize that. And that can happen not just to a nation, it can happen to a church or any organization. The term elder in Titus 1 and so forth implies maturity and experience. And it's wrong for a believer to be thrust into leadership too soon, as Paul advises First Timothy in chapter 3, verse 6. And age itself is no guarantee of maturity, obviously. Sometimes the youth will outstrip the elders in spiritual zeal, and yet sometimes even in judgment. So the New International Version translates verse 16, Woe unto you, O land, whose king was a servant. The suggestion there is that the servant became a king with the help of his friends, and now he's obligated to give them all jobs to remain on the throne. Hirelings could not be dismissed because the king's security depended upon them, so the victor goes to spoils. In other words, it's a self-dealing kind of thought that underlies all that. Okay, the next, verse 18 is, it focuses on in actual directly incompetence. By much slothfulness, the building decays, and through idleness, the hands of the house drops through. The foolish officers here are so busy with enjoyment they have no time for employment and the buildings and the organizations start to fall apart. Proverbs 18.9, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him that is a great waster. That sounds like a comment on the unions. It's always interesting that if you're in a workforce, there are conditions in which you don't want to work too hard or you'll get the ire of the, the local peer group. In any case, there's certainly a difference between those who use an office and those who merely hold an office. Immature people enjoy the privileges and so on, but they ignore the responsibilities. Woodrow Wilson said, A friend of mine says that every man who takes office in Washington either grows or swells. When I give a man an office, I watch carefully to see whether he is swelling or growing. Interesting. A feast, last verse 19, A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Strange thing. Maketh, really means maketh glad the life. And uh, this really declares the philosophy of the foolish officers. Eat all you can, enjoy all you can, get all you can. And they're totally indifferent to the responsibilities of the office is the implication here. And it's interesting to see in recent years how the uh, in developing nations that get uh, aid from the, the uh, IMF or whatever, how easy it is for unscrupulous leaders to steal the government funds to build their own kingdoms. And this is, of course, tragically and religious, or tragically true in religious organizations too. The scandals among the some of the largest, most conspicuous ministries is is really disturbing. But it's interesting, even in development countries, how Yasser Arafat has billions of dollars in his personal accounts in Switzerland, and so all that uh, you know, uh, he greases his first, his own palms first, of course. But it's also true. We, I think we're all familiar with the scandals you know, among TV TV evangelists and so forth. Many of them. It's tragic. Love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, Paul told Timothy. And it was Prophet Amos that cried out against the wicked rulers of his day, who trampled the heads of the poor and treated them like dust of the earth. Amos 2 and 4 and 5, it's all through there. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 20. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought. And curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. 
For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. You know that little, we all have heard the expression, a little bird told me. There are some that believe that this came from this verse. As Tom uses that expression, there was even thinking of evil thought will find its way. You can almost imagine in this, you know, group of off- these foolish officers having a party in one of their private rooms. And instead of toasting the king, they're cursing him or making light of him, is what the, the thing really says. And of course, uh, they wouldn't do this if the king was around. And they were confident the company, you know, all the buddies would keep it a secret. And of course, they didn't. Somebody told the king, and that of course gave him, gave the king reason to take, uh, punish them or dismiss them from their offices. You understand what a secret is? A secret is something you tell one person at a time. You know. See, even if we don't respect the person in the office, we need to have respect for the office. Is, the, is part of the thought here. It's also amplified in the first seven verses of Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 and elsewhere. You shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. Exodus 22, verse 28. And of course, these hirelings here were indiscreet when they cursed the king. They should have known that somebody would spill the beans. A statesman asks, what is the best for my country? A politician asks, what's the best for my party? But a mere hireling or office holder says, what's safest and most profitable for me? And that's, we're moving that way tragically more and more. Well, all of this then completes the uh, review, Solomon's review uh, of his fourth argument, that life is not worth living, the certainty of death. And uh, he's, in, he's concluded that life is indeed worth living, Um, even though death is unavoidable and life is unpredictable. That's really the the flavor of of chapter 9. And and he highlights here what we must do to avoid folly and live by wisdom. So this all concludes the second part of his discourse. He's reviewed four arguments presented in chapters 1 and 2 and decided that life was really worth living after all. The best thing we can do is trust God, do our work, and accept what God sends us and enjoy each day of our lives to the glory of God. That's all been all through here. Now all that remains for Solomon to conclude his discourse is uh, practical application. And that's what he's going to do in the next two chapters. He's going to bring together all the different strands of truth that he's laid down so far, and he's going to weave this into a conclusion to show us what God expects us to do to be satisfied. And and that's his whole theme. And that's uh, exactly what Warren Wiersbe calls his commentary, be satisfied, is the, the key theme. So we made it on time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. 